Good afternoon. This is October 30th, 2007. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus. And today we are happy to have Shirley S. Woods join us. Uh, this is a home front interview versus a veterans interview because Shirley did help out on the home front back in the days of World War II. Welcome, Shirley. Thank you. Can you tell us what your, uh, where you currently live? I live in Natick, Massachusetts. And what is your age, if you don't mind my asking? I'm 85 years old. And your marital status? I'm a widow. And do you have children? Yes, I have two living children. And you have grandchildren? I have one grandchild. Shirley, where were you born? In Utica, New York. And were you raised in Utica also? Yes, I was. Went to school there. Um, went off to college. And where did you go to college? Cornell University. Was it common back then for women in your high school class to go to college? Um, it may have been, it was the beginning, but um, my dad felt it was as important for young women as for young men to go to college. I'd been a pretty good student, and um, he borrowed money and sent me off to college. That's where I met my husband-to-be. And you, what was your um, major Major in? Thank you. I was a sociology major. And you met your husband there. And what was his major? He was a chemical engineering student. What time was this? What dates did you go to college? I went to um, school in 1939, graduated the spring of 1943. War had already begun. War had begun. And what were you hearing about the war? Well, we knew about the war going on. Uh, there were a lot of naval students and others who were beginning to come on campus. And um, But when Pearl Harbor was bombed, it had been a big prom weekend. The colleges used to have big proms. Bands like Benny Goodman and others came to school. And we came back from a weekend like that, and one of my friends said, Shirley, do you know there was a big bombing in Hawaii? Do you Pearl remember Harbor. how you felt about that? I had no inkling um, that anything was seriously the matter in the world at that time. Though I did read the New York Times most days, a lot of us college students did. but. Um, and our country claimed at that later on that they weren't aware, uh, even though there were signals there, just as there have been signals for other wars, that things were about to happen. But they've always said, oh, no, we didn't really know about it. We really didn't think it was going to happen. So looking back prior to the bombing of Pearl Harbor, what was your life like prior to World War II even breaking out? Um, you were a college student. You mentioned earlier you really weren't aware, but you did say you read the New York Times. Was yeah. there information in the Times back then? I don't believe there was that much. And um, later they did say, yes, they should have known. There had, been, um, there had been talks, and those who were involved in keeping abreast of things did know. But they, it was a shock. I think if you read most of the papers later, it was a big shock in the country that time. Before the attack of Pearl Harbor, did you think or have any kind of idea that the U.S. would join in the war? Well, they were trying to stay out. Things were going on in Europe with Hitler, and certainly very bad times. But um, we didn't think, a lot of people felt we should be isolated. It wasn't our war and we shouldn't be involved. Did you have family or friends who enlisted in the armed services? Um, yes, I had several cousins who did, 
and they all came back safely. Um, one of them I was, they were overseas, and some of the faraway islands, I forget, one of them begins with a K, and I can't think of the name now. And he had come from a family that had a large bakery, and he said nothing that he had done before had prepared him for baking for, you know, thousands and thousands of soldiers or sailors. So he was, in, he was one of the cooks. Yeah. But so I did hear about some of my um, college friends who had gone and that they were killed. And um, as I had mentioned Benny Goodman before, and he had come, they said that time, to Cornell for that prom because he had a much younger brother who was going to school there. And that brother, I believe, was killed in World War II. Did you write to any of your cousins or to other servicemen? No, I didn't. But um, I did, did USO work. And of course, I was working. I, as soon as I got out of school, I was working at a Remington Arms factory. And they had hired, I think it was 21 or 25 of us. I forget now. <laughs> That was in 1943, to um, that because we were college graduates, they felt they could train us to do what they wanted. And I became a project engineer at the factory. And where was Remington Arms Factory? In Illion, New York. So um, somebody would drive me there. I didn't know how to drive yet. And somebody would drive me there to work. And, um, but uh, what I did was for project engineering, under a, Mr. a very nice Mr. Flanagan, um, if the other departments wanted m new machinery, they wanted more help, whatever, then I would go to interview them and write up a project and bring it back, Mr. Flanagan, and then it would be decided whether they should get it or not. They did also have to say how much, the other department would have to say how much they thought it was going to cost. And if a, ran over that, 10% um, over, then I had to write another part of the project again for the extra money. But the thing is, we had been hired, this whole group of us from all over the country, um, to, um, so that they could say that the male men who were working there as engineers were only doing essential work and other things that were not wholly essential we were helping them to get through. And we meaning women? The w we women, who, see the women, we, women graduates were hired. And the women from the, who had been working there, I heard later, some of them were quite upset. They felt that the um, company should have hired women f from their groups, that they knew more about things, they didn't have to be trained, and they could have done the job but the company had chosen to hire college graduates. Now, as a college graduate and a project engineer, were you making as much money as male project engineers, or do you know that? Well, my husband, who was a chemical engineer, which was a five-year course, and he was third in his class, from a very difficult class um, study at Cornell University, considered one of the most difficult courses on campus. He was making five dollars less a month than I was. <laughs> I, ha I took a slight decrease in pay when I left Remington Arms to go work at Columbia University. They said they could not pay me so much, and it was only about a little over a thousand dollars a month. But I was making slightly more than he was. And when you left Remington Arms to go to Columbia, what? was your job at Columbia? Well, the expression was we were leak testers. We used a machine called a spectrometer. It was quite a large machine, and another woman and I pushed it. Um, and um, recently, um, an engineer told me there are still spectrometers in use. They're probably much smaller than what we did. And as I said, a Columbia University was building the prototype for what would go up in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And what was that for those who may not know? What were they prototyping? Um, they were 
um, putting up what would be the cells through which the poisonous gases would go. And, the, and the, they were huge because I did go to Oak Ridge you know, later. But at the time, what we did was we took the spectrometer machine, we wheeled it over to a section that we were told to go to. And we would look to see if that wall were tight that not even a pin drop could go through. And when the needle on the spectrometer would get us as close as we felt we could get, then we would call in a male engineer who would come. And they wanted to make sure that when the actual cells were created, that nothing would go through and escape into the atmosphere. So when you did this work with the spectrometer, did you wear special clothing and were you in a sealed off room? Um, no, we weren't. We were in the building and I don't recall wearing special clothing because <clears throat> they were not using the gases at that time in this, at Columbia. They were just trying to get the structure um, decided upon that would be going up in Oak Ridge. And Oak Ridge was an area that had been farmland, but it was close to the power from the TVA. And so they moved families out of there, took over that area. And, and that was the federal government that did that? Yes. Mm -hmm. So how long were you at Columbia before you went to Oak Ridge? So we were married in November of 44, and we went down to Oak Ridge. We requested to go. They asked for volunteers to come in um, the summer of 45. And did both you and your husband go? Yes, we did. And did you know at the time what your jobs would be? My husband may have. He was much better informed than I was and understood it, of course, much better than I, the sociology major. But um, they said they would have need for me again. And um, we did, I remember going into one of the huge cells. They were really huge. And um, what we did there, whether we used our spectrometers or anything there, I don't really remember. But um, I did see them. And then later I did work in smaller laboratories on um, machines, line recorders. And they would give me other jobs to do. Um, my husband very often, when I'd say to him, I don't know if I'll be able to do this next job. I'm not prepared for this. Don't worry, you'll do it. You'll explain to me what you have to do, and I'll get you through it, which he did. And he would help you. And yeah. so, <clears throat> You were working in the labs, and what was your husband doing at that time? He was doing work that I re very technical work, because from there he got, because of the machinery and things they used there that time, he got a head start in computers later on. My husband, by the time he died, was actually com completing um, computers from scratch, starting out. He was a wonderful mathematician. Were you treated well when you were at Oak Ridge? Yes, we were. Um, we did work alongside uh, some of the um, young Southern women and men, and there were soldiers there too. There were a lot of soldiers who were working there, and we knew that those soldiers would never be sent overseas. There was always fear that if they fell into enemy hands, they might give away some vital information. So there were soldiers and there were civilians. civilians working together. Did the outside world of Tennessee and other surrounding states or even in the U.S. know about what you were doing? I don't really know. Um, it was um, a very secret. I mean, the reservation was there, and I'm sure people from Knoxville, Tennessee, which was the nearest big city, knew that this was going on. The land had been taken for government purposes. And um, those people who were knowledgeable about it knew we were in a race with Germany to get an atom bomb first. So and, the term atom bomb was being used? Well, the young woman who worked with me with a spectrometer said to me one day, 
Think of it, Shirley. Someday we'll drop a bomb and blow up a whole city. And I said, we will. And she said, didn't your husband tell you? And I said, no. And he said to me, he didn't feel that I had to know. So your husband knew that yes. this was... So once you realized what it was that you were all working on, um, how did you feel about that? Well, I didn't... I just took each day, and I didn't... When they actually bombed in Japan, you know, to bring it... As President Truman said to bring an end to the war, that he thought long and hard about doing this and, and what would happen to innocent Japanese people, but that he felt he had to stop the war. And that was what happened. And did you agree with that at the time? We, at the time, we felt we were being very patriotic. We were doing what our government requested. Oh, but I do have to tell you, my father-in-law was very well read. And at dinner one day, he said, you children treat your work such a big secret. You'd think you were putting zippers on atoms. And um, my husband said to me later, you, your face didn't change, Shoy. I was very pleased that you didn't <laughs> gulp or something. But my father-in-law, who was a very well-read man, said later, I guessed, didn't I? Didn't I? I guessed. And, um, but somebody else told me that soon after the war began, they were doing these things. Books, there had been books about atomic energy, not with the idea of doing it, using it for war, but for energy purposes. And then those books were taken off the shelves of the libraries. At that time. That's what I was told later on by somebody who seemed quite knowledgeable. Were you paid well when you were at Oak Ridge? Oh, my dad thought I was paid very well by today's standards, no. But again, the dollar was worth a dollar then. And we were very well satisfied. Um, life was actually very pleasant at Oak Ridge. Uh, it was a young community. There were all kinds of clubs that sprang up. Uh, we were close enough to the Smoky Mountains of Gatlinburg. And when we would wing, um, we would work different shifts and then when after we had uh, worked, say, the midnight to 8 o'clock shift, we would get enough time, we would get a few days off. And I can't remember, we didn't have a car, there must have been a bus, and we would go to Gatlinburg. And when we would get the um, ersatz butter then, which you had to color, we would get it more easily up in Gatlinburg, and I would keep it out on the windowsill that it, because we didn't have refrigeration for it, but it was cool enough, and then we'd bring it back, you know, to have in our little efficiency apartment. We started out in a dormitory and went on a list. Married couples did get houses, but we got an efficiency apartment, all brand new. And it was on what you would call the base? On the base. Mm -hmm. And um, unless you were a doctor very high up, you could not have a telephone, though, in your room. And there was a receptionist who would get, if a message came in for you, you'd get it. But we had um, little cots in the room. We had small kitchenettes. We had tables that came down from the walls. And I think we paid $30 a month. And somebody came in seven days a week to dust. But she did break a bunch of our records. She dusted them too well. and. Um, so um, we were so very content. So was that to pay for the cleaning person, or was that for your rent also? Um, gee, it might have been the whole thing, you know, that we got that. We really paid very little. Did you get fed by the no. government? Or? <clears throat> no, there were groceries, small groceries. and um, But I remember when I went there and I asked how to cook certain things, it was done a southern way, and I didn't understand it. You know, had to be taught what it was. And then they would say, now, um, uh, you come back now. And the first time they said that to me, I turned and I said, didn't I give you the right change? And, but that was the expression, you know, to come back another time. Another time. You come back now. Yes. <laughs> that was a southern so thing. it was an experience for you being in 
another part of the United States. Yes, I was told by some of my southern friends that I talked too fast. And yet when I went home on a vacation to uh, Utica, New York, some of my friends, when I spoke on the phone to them, said to me, you've picked up a southern accent. <laughs> so, that was Very it. subtle, and you probably didn't realize yeah. you had picked yeah. it up. But there was some place we went right on the base to have our teeth cleaned and so forth. And uh, yes, I remember one hygienist asked me where I came from. And when I told her Utica, she said, oh no, she came from Syracuse, which is 50 miles from Utica. She said, you used to be just like a New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, when you were stationed, for lack of a better word, at Oak Ridge, were you treated differently than men who were doing not exactly the same job, but similar jobs? Um, no, we women sort of did certain jobs and the men did other jobs. There was a definite difference, you know. So it was really defined. <clears throat> but, oh yes, but I do want to tell you that on this, in the building where we worked, there were water fountains and there were bathrooms for whites and for blacks. How did you react to that coming from a state where We were it wasn't very prevalent? amazed. There were not that many black people working with us, but we were very amazed to see those. We had never seen signs like that before. So both the water fountains and the restrooms? Yes. So they were segregated. Do you think your work contributed to the war effort? I know I did what I was told to do. Um, the procedures that they asked me to do, I learned to do each time. And um, I th thought at the time I was helping, whether I actually did. There was nobody who ever said to me, oh no, you know, you're no good, <laughs> we're laying you off. Normally, what did you wear to work? Um, well, as the picture shows, we wore skirts and blouses. We wore saddle shoes, ankle socks. But if um, I have a larger picture someplace at home, and you look closely, the blouses and skirts we were wearing then, we could be wearing today. They really, what goes around comes around. They Very were being in style today. Yes. But, you know, if you hold up a magnifying glass, to the picture I gave you, you'll see. There's nothing, oh my, you know, that's not Victorian or anything like that. Do you feel that your work and the contribution you gave at Oak Ridge and at um, Columbia were appreciated after the war? Well, we had gotten the notice and all. Why don't you and, explain um, that, what the notice I don't know, is? I don't think they really kept in touch and, um, but I don't think we felt that we'd been neglected or anything. Now when we you were, say, excuse me one minute, Shirley, when yeah. they, you said you've gotten the notice, explain what that is. That was the one from the Under Secretary of War thanking me for my participation. And I think if you read that, you'll see what he said about it. But also, what about from family, friends, and other acquaintances that you came in contact with when, at that point in time, you could possibly, or could you, talk about what you had done? Well, um, most of the family were very pleased that we had contributed. Uh, one neighbor has told us uh, early on um, that the FBI had come to ask different neighbors if Shirley Shapiro could be trusted because she was going to be doing secret work for the government. So the FBI did a background check on you yes. prior to going to Oak Ridge or prior to going to Columbia? I don't, I couldn't tell you which time. Did that surprise you? That the FBI yes, had gone you know, to your neighborhood? I just didn't feel, well, I, of course I knew I was trustworthy, but I didn't think that it was so important. <laughs> that I was such an important member that they would do that. While you were working at Oak Ridge, did you, how did you hear about the war effort? You mentioned you didn't have a phone, but were there, there were newspapers? There were newspapers. We must have had a radio too. Mm -hmm. 
but there were but there were newspapers, and we knew how the war was coming along and all. And um, um, one time I went home to Utica, and the newspaper. I don't know how I was, why I was contacted, but somebody did contact me, and they did have an interview with me. And I think the atom bomb had already been dropped at that time. Yes, but you say, what a family think. Um, nobody said to me, oh, what a terrible thing you were doing. But after the war had been over a while, my husband and I sat down and we got quite philosophical about this. How was the atom bomb going to be used now? We did not want more cities blown up. And temporarily, we did become members of a peace group, which was, I think, started by a group of doctors and, and scientists who were concerned. And then um, an older member of the family, um, an uncle, I guess, and my husband, said to us, Bill, you still have um, top security um, uh, working papers, and that's the way you're considered. And you'll be working on secret projects, or, and you should be very careful if anybody came into that group and with the idea of fil infiltrating, you know, and they did anything bad, it could backfire on all the rest of you whose feelings were just idealistic. And so we did drop out of the group because and we just, we were young, Bill was about to start working you know, for other companies. But he did work for a while and did need certification. Your husband did, yes. he needed high clearance. But I did not work again after that. Tell us, you mentioned earlier about when you went to Gatlinburg and getting butter. Tell us a little if you remember about any rationing, not only the butter, sugar, meat, but shortages of some clothing, nylon, stockings we always yes, hear about, or yes. things like that. Do you remember back then about that? I remember, well, the first nylons we wore, uh, they did wear like iron. and um, But on a cold night, if you were wearing nylons in Utica, New York, in the older days, I'd come home sometime. Your my feet would freeze uh, because we didn't wear short, short skirts, but we didn't wear as long ones as we do now. So, but um, I, I can remember my mother with ration coupons to get meat and the other things. And um, but we seemed to manage always. And um, we never never thought of a burden. Um, my dad was active in different ways, and my uh, father-in-law, as I wrote on the paper, which I forgot to bring in, um, he was an air raid warden. He would go out to make sure that houses, you know, windows were dark. They had special, you no know, curtains or drapes or things. And did you and the people have were darkened out. windows in your home, do you remember? In Utica, I don't think so. But it, my father-in-law lived in New York City. There, they, there was a difference. And my father-in-law and mother-in-law were very active in um, selling bonds, U.S. bonds. And also, uh, they were charter members of an organization called the 52 Club. My father-in-law and some other men had gone to a restaurant one night, and a man came in who obviously was a veteran, uh, was crippled or somehow disabled. And the men at the table said, let's pay for that guy's dinner. And after they did that, they said, gee, that's just one veteran. Let's do it 52 weeks out of the year. And that's how the 52 Club got started in New York City. And they would have picnics. They had picnics where people could go who had artificial limbs. They could go swimming. They could bring their families with them. My mother-in-law and father-in-law were out all the time doing things for the 52 Club. And I think, what was his name? The one who took part in, I think, best days of our lives, um, his name Crow, I forget. I met him at a Braille, um, at, at the Mass Association for the Blind years later. He, I believe, had lost both arms 
and had hooks that time. And he had been a sailor, I believe. And I met him there. But my mother-in-law had met him at the 52 Club at different times. And other people, but they had a huge group of people who became members of the 52 Club. And very active with very the active. community. Did you have, or did any of your family have a victory garden? No, garden. my parents lived in a two-story house, and we did not own the house. And the man who owned the house grew a lot of flowers, but he didn't grow any food stuff. When you mention your in-laws being part of the um, bonds, sold bonds, do you remember about the war bond drive? Oh yes, when we got married, we got a lot of bonds that time as wedding gifts. And you put them in a safety deposit box, or did you? Yes, keep them we, in we a were going to let place? them. We did. I think let them mature. Were there newsreels at the movies? Were you able to go to the movies? Yeah, we went to the movies, and they would have that thing that would spin around on the news of the day. There was some kind of music with it, and all. And we would all see what was going on, but not to the extent that you see today. But we did see some more pictures and things. During your time at Oak Ridge, and for that matter, Columbia University, did you develop close friendships with any individuals? We, we had a wonderful group of friends in Oak Ridge, and many of them did stay on. And um, we did lose touch because my husband um, the company would move him about, and it's, um, we didn't just pick up the phone in those days and make phone calls uh, or to write letters, and um, so we lost track of them. But we, they really have been very good friends. With well, one of them, um, um, I, through my temple, I met a young couple, and the man was asking me if I'd always lived in Natick, and when I told him no and so forth, and um, other places you've lived. And I met, when I mentioned Oak Ridge, he said, my parents were down there. And I said, oh my golly, we knew your parents. They were among our good friends. Yes, and I did get to see them at a barbecue when one of the young couple's daughters was graduating from college, from Cornell too, I think it was. And we went over and I felt so badly that we'd never known since we'd lost touch he said, oh, he would have loved to have seen my husband, too, you know. My husband had already died. And, but it was funny, he said to me, didn't you used to have brown hair? And I said, 50 years ago, I had brown hair. And it was that beautiful gray that it is now? Well, um, I colored it very briefly and, um, in my early 40s, and I became blonde for some reason. The dyes were different, and I thought, I wanted to be a redhead, but I never wanted to be a blonde. I'll let it be. <laughs> what did you think of the Japanese overall? What did you think of the Japanese and the Germans? Well, the moving pictures we saw were of nurses being attacked and other people, and what was the bridge over something river, special river, the river Kwai or something, and I think it was maybe the best picture of the year that time, and that they had these enforced marches for prisoners and all. And we did meet, um, Bill met a distant cousin of his who had been a prisoner of war and had escaped without being disabled or anything, but he was witness, it was not anybody's picnic. But um, so the propaganda we showed was very anti-Japanese. And when I went to China, not too many years ago, the Chinese still do not forgive the Japanese for what they did to them. There was a lot of anti-Japanese feelings in China. What were your most memorable experiences, or taking it even a step further, memorable characters that you met, or a humorous event that you might have remembered, anything that falls in the Oak Ridge? Or no. Oak Ridge, yes. Well, as I say, we would have parties all the time, and uh, we would have these little trips away to, you know, Gatlinburg, which when we saw it many years later on a trip down to Florida, we stopped there 
And I said, oh, it looks like a small Coney Island. <laughs> but um, we would go there, we would see bears and beautiful plants. And I don't know all the things that we did there, but it was just wonderful to go there. It was a beautiful spot. After the job, after, I'm sorry, after the war ended, you said you did not continue working at Oak Ridge. No. After the war ended, how long did you stay at Oak Ridge? We were there just about a year and a half, something like that, yes. Total a year and a half? I would say about a year and a half. And we went back to New York City for a while and, um, did your husband's job take him back there? No, um, I don't what exactly what it was, but we decided to leave. And um, so we went to New York, from New York, we went to Washington, D.C. for a while. And um, there was a secret project. And um, we were hoping to start a family. But what I did do was um, an aunt of his was a professional Red Cross worker. She did disaster work. And she got me situated so that I could go out. This was still with helping soldiers and things, though, during the war, that um, I would go out. Somebody would pick me up by car, take me someplace to interview somebody who wanted, uh, whose family wanted a soldier or a sailor to come home for whatever personal reason there was. And I was not allowed to take any notes during that time. We did not tape them or anything. But then I, as soon as I got out of the car, I would write down everything that transpired and report it to somebody else. And then it would be decided whether the man could have a furlough or come, whether it was, there was reason enough that he should come home. Do you remember I, what some of the reasons were? A death in the family or an illness in the family? I don't or? remember, but those were, the, I think, the general gist of it that time. And I remember yeah. I did go to, Helen Hayes came in, and this aunt did get us tickets to go and see her at one of the big uh, buildings or outdoor places in Washington, D.C. We loved being in Washington, D.C. in those days, just loved it. When you mentioned being in D.C. and your husband working on a secret project, do you know now what that project was? No, I don't. You don't. Looking back on the news coverage during the war, do you think you received accurate information about the war? Well, again, as I say, it was such a shock, I think, to the country that Japan would bomb us at Pearl Harbor, do that. Uh, I don't think your average American had any inkling that something like that could happen. There were people going overseas and helping driving ambulances in Europe and doing other things there. They wanted to be involved. But I don't think that your average American was at all prepared for Pearl Harbor. What do you think, what did you think then, and what do you think now regarding the war effort? I know you did mention that you did join a peace group, but then left that for your husband's career. Yeah. But what is your thought about it then versus now? Well, I don't think we ever regretted that we had done what we did. Um, someone did say to me, doesn't it embarrass you now when you think back that that bomb, those bombs fell, what happened in Japan? And I said, it was a terrible thing, a tra an extraordinary tragedy. But for me to feel, oh my God, I wish I'd never done any of that. I said, no, um, I didn't have all the facts. And it was, war is terrible. And it we felt we won that war and that um, we had saved the world for democracy. And I don't know that we've ever felt that involved since. I, yes, I was a USO hostess too when I worked before I got married. And my mother was a USO hostess. And that was in New York? In Utica. Mm -hmm. 
As we wrap this up, is there a thought or one memory you'd like to share with the family who might be viewing this tape or with the community who will also borrow to this tape to you? I don't know exactly what you know they would want to get out of it. It's that you know we come to places in our lives, and uh, forces stronger than we are do push us along. We have choices, but. Um, there are many times when we do what we think is absolutely right. We may decide later, I wish it could have been different. But that you, you should think things out. But um, I think our generation felt the government asked things of you. Even later, Kennedy says, that's not what the government can do for you, what you can do for your country. In fact, I would have liked it if one of my children had gone into the Peace Corps. Not one of them did, but my daughter is in transcendental meditation, and she feels that they will help bring peace to the world. She's very idealistic. Well, Shirley S. Woods, we want to thank you today for sharing your memories about World War II and what you did to contribute to, as you said, the democracy at that time. Thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you. Thank you. I, hope it's, I hope it will be meaningful to somebody.